Hello everyone. The Patnam 2021 was conducted this past weekend. The Patnam is an undergraduate mathematics competition consisting of six problems in the morning and six problems in the afternoon. In this video, we'll be covering the solutions to problems A1 to A3, all of which have pretty short and elegant solutions. Without further ado, let us take a look at problem 1. So problem 1 is as follows. A grasshopper starts at the origin in the coordinate plane and makes a sequence of hops. Each hop has length 5 and after each hop, the grasshopper is at a point whose coordinates are both integers. So for example, from the origin, the grasshopper can go to 5, 0 but can also go to 4, 3 or 3, 4. So in this case, there are 12 possible locations for the grasshopper after the first hop. What is the smallest number of hops needed for the grasshopper to reach the point 2021-2021? So an interesting sounding combinatorics problem. And I think the solution is actually quite intuitive. Now one of the first thing that you will probably try is to form a path from the origin to 2021-2021 while heuristically trying to minimize the number of hops needed. So one good idea would be to try and go along the northeast direction as much as possible. So exploiting the possibility of going along 3, 4 and 4, 3. So indeed, let's see what happens if we do 3, 4 and 4, 3, which will give us plus 7 plus 7 when we do one pair. Now we maybe want to do that repeatedly. So we realize that if we take 2, 0, 2, 1 and divide by 7, we get 2, 8, 8 and some remainder. So let's try doing that a total of 2, 8, 8 times and we'll end up at 2016, 2016. So very nice, and coincidentally, we can now finish uh, at 2021, 2021, if we do a plus 5, 0, and 0 plus 5. So what we have just done is we have constructed a, a sequence of hops that requires only 578 hops to reach the finish point. Okay, the key question then is, is this the smallest number of hops needed? To prove that this is a minimum, we consider the quantity that is the sum of the current x and y coordinates. So the starting point, the quantity is 0, and at the end, the quantity is uh, the sum of these two, so it's 4, 0, 4, 2. Now looking at each of the 12 options from each point, we see that the quantity could possibly decrease or increase, but it will definitely increase by less than or equal to 7. So it, will, it can decrease or increase, but no more than increase no more than 7 after each hop. This means that to reach from 0 to 4042, we will need at least the ceiling of 4042 divided by 7, which is 578. And we have just constructed a sequence that requires 578 hops in the first part. So indeed, 578 is the minimum number of hops. So that's all to problem 1, which is not so difficult to work out. Hope you enjoyed that problem. And now let's move on to problem 2. So problem 2 is a real analysis problem, or perhaps you could call it a calculus problem. So for every positive real number x, so we fix x, we define the function g of x given by the limit as r go to 0 of x plus 1 to the power r plus 1 minus x to the power r plus 1 whole thing to the power 1 minus r. So we fix for each fix x, we, we take the limit of r. This gives us a function that depends on x. Now we find we are required to find the limit of gx over x as x goes to infinity. So this limit is definitely not very intuitive and very hard to grapple with. But may, when we try to compute a limit that is often difficult to grapple with, one of the things that come to mind would be L'Hopital's rule. So let's see, can we find a way to apply L'Hopital's rule to compute this limit? Well, this is not exactly in the form of a fraction or like that is like 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. So maybe we want to first take the log so that this comes down and then we have a fraction. So let's see, can we find log of gx first? Since the natural log is a continuous function, we can actually compute the natural log of gx by taking natural log of the limit, but then by continuity, we can push the log inside. So indeed, this is given by the limit of the log of this expression. The 1 over r comes down. So now we have a fraction log of this nasty thing 
over R. Okay, this looks like a prime candidate for L'Hopital's rule, and indeed you can check that as R goes to zero, uh, this thing tends to log one, which is zero, and the bottom tends to zero as well. And you can check the various things you need to check for L'Hopital's rule to be applied. And so we can apply L'Hopital's rule. Now L'Hopital's rule say that this thing will be the limit of uh, top differentiated over bottom differentiated. Now it's very easy to differentiate the bottom, it's just one. The top is a bit nastier. Now the you have to differentiate with respect to R. Now not, let's not forget about that. It's, R is the variable with respect to which we are differentiating. So we need to, to differentiate the log, we need to have the differentiate of the inside divided by the inside. So how do we differentiate something like this? So recall this trick from calculus where if we need to differentiate something that's in the power, we take we write this expression as e to the log of itself. So e to the log of itself, basically after that you bring down the r plus 1, so it becomes e to the r plus 1 log x plus 1. And now this is just a normal exponential differentiation, which is quite easy to do because now you have r times log, right? And then so the log comes down, so this is log x plus 1 times the original exponential. And the original exponential, of course, is the same as x plus 1 to the r plus 1. So this is how you differentiate the power term. So with this tip in mind, we can go ahead to perform the differentiation. We have uh, L'Hopital's rule, bottom is 1, so the top differentiated is the, the thing in the bracket differentiated divided by the thing in the bracket. Okay, now this fraction can now be directly evaluated for its limit. Because the bottom, for example, when r goes to 0, this thing, the power goes to 1, and this is x plus 1 minus x. So we have x plus 1 minus x. This is not 0, thank goodness. The top also is quite easy to evaluate directly. This is uh, goes to x plus 1, this goes to x, so we have this thing. So this limit is indeed well defined. And we can tidy up the terms. The bottom is 1. The top, uh, the power can go on top of the log. The power can go on top of the log. So, and then we take the difference of the log, we have a fraction here. Okay, so this is just manipulation. And now we see that log of gx is log of this. So very good. gx is given by this much simpler expression here. And so we can compute what is the limit of gx over x directly now. Uh, substituting in gx, we have x plus 1 over x, both to the power of x plus 1. Uh, dividing by x throughout. Uh, this thing, we have 1 plus 1 over x, whole thing to the power x plus 1. And of course, you can pull out a copy of 1 plus 1 over x. So you have 1 plus 1 over x to the power of x. This thing, the limit of which is your familiar looking e, this limits to 1. So the overall answer is e. So this is all there is to question 2. It's really uh, one application of L'Hopital's rule, uh, some nasty differentiation, but that's all. Now let us take a look at problem 3, which is a very nice geometry problem. Okay, so for problem 3, we are supposed to determine all positive integers n, for which the sphere x squared plus y squared plus d squared equals n. So this is a sphere that has radius square root n. So for which the sphere has an inscribed regular tetrahedron, whose vertices have integer coordinates. So in the previous slide, we saw the diagram of the tetrahedron inscribed in the sphere. We want to find all possible uh, n so that the sphere of radius square root n, you can put a tetrahedron inside with the vertices at integer coordinates. Okay. The way we'll do this is firstly, we'll see what, uh, what this forces on n. So we find a necessary condition for n. And then for all such n's, we construct a solution to show that indeed uh, these are all the n that works. Okay, so starting with the necessary condition, let the tetrahedral vertices be v1, v2, v3, and v4. And then we are going to say that these have integer coordinates. And from this, try and deduce what necessary condition n must fulfill. Okay, so intuitively what you want to do is you want to use the fact that these have integer coordinates. Find a way to compute some quantity uh, involving these coordinates and involving n so that we can force a condition on n. 
And one quantity of interest that naturally comes to mind is volume. So we realize that the volume of the tetrahedron can be called can be calculated in terms of the vertices coordinates. Indeed, the way to do this is we first recall that the volume is one third the area of base times height. And then we can compute all these things in terms of the vertices using cross products and dot products. So let's follow this closely. Firstly, we have this v3 minus v4 is this vector over here. And then v2 minus v4 is the other vector over here. Now, if we take half of the cross product of these two vectors, what we get is a vector whose magnitude is the area of the triangle and the direction is perpendicular to the face of the triangle. In other words, parallel along the uh, vector of the height. So if we take that vector and times one third dot the height vector, we are effectively reproducing this formula up to a plus minus sign. So actually you can put a plus minus if you want to be technically correct. Now, uh, why is the height vector four third of V1? Because V1 is the vector from the origin, which is the center of the tetrahedron to that vertex. And you can do some basic geometry to conclude that the height is actually four thirds of that length. So indeed, the volume is given by this expression. Now, if I collect the fractions together, uh, I'll have two knife. And then we have cross product of vectors dot product into a, another vector. And all of them have integer coordinates. So what we end up with is an integer number. So the volume is two knife times an integer. But at the same time, we can do uh, some 3D geometry. It's not too uh, complicated about AIME type of uh, manipulations to compute, to conclude that the volume of a tetrahedron inscribed in a sphere of radius R is given by eight square root three over 27 R cubed. So now we recall that R is equal to uh, square root N, and then we equate these two. What do we get? We get that two knife of integer is eight square root three over 27 times N times square root N, right? So now we have a condition that is on N, and if we put 27 over eight N to the other side, what we have is square root three N is a rational number. So this is a very strong condition. And in fact, we know that n is a positive integer, right? So square root of a positive integer is either irrational or it is an integer itself. So square root of 3n is in fact an integer, which implies that n must be of the form 3 times a perfect square. So this is a very strong condition. And let us now see whether this is sufficient in the sense that if we are given n of this form, can I always construct a solution? And in this case, the construction is quite, quite uh, beautiful. So we have uh, consider a cube of side length 2a uh, centered at the origin. The sides are parallel to the uh, three uh, x, y, z uh, directions. So in other words, this vertex will be a, a, a. This vertex is minus a, minus a, minus a. And now we just take a te the tetrahedron that is given by the four opposite vertices. Uh, the natural way of inscribing a tetrahedron in a cube. And so all the four vertices have integer coordinates. And furthermore, they are all located at a distance 3a squared away from the origin. So this is the tetrahedron that we desire to be constructed. Now that's all for problem 3. I hope you enjoy the solution. Next week, we'll be covering problems b1 to b3. So please drop a like, subscribe to the channel, and stay tuned for more videos.